Okay, let's start the third lecture on discrete mathematics. Can someone in chat please write if you can hear me and uh, if you can see the slides? So my name is Evgeny. Stepan asked me to replace him for this particular lecture. And as you can see, it will be on the topic of uh, NP completeness and the classes P and NP. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions and if I need to repeat something. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, the aim of today's lecture is uh, to define the main concepts related to the uh, famous complexity classes P and NP, and to the theory of NP completeness, uh, and uh, discuss one of the most fundamental results, uh, namely the uh, Cook Levin theorem, which uh, provides uh, an explicit but uh, quite simple example of an NP complete problem. Uh, so we'll start with uh, informal definitions of these concepts and uh, try to uh, discuss the connection between them, and after that, we uh, we'll define uh, these notions more precisely and try to formulate and maybe discuss the sketch of the proof of the cook levin theorem. So let's start. Um, so we start with the P class. So this is a complexity class. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, Stepan uh, have already discussed many of these concepts uh, during previous lectures, maybe not uh, so formally, but still. So, uh, as you may already know, we usually consider uh, algorithmic problems of a certain type, namely decision problems. So, uh, these are the problems where, given an input, uh, you need to give one of two answers, yes or no. So, typically, you have some class of objects like formulae, uh, graphs, or any type of constructive objects. And uh, you need to decide whether a given object as an input has some property or not. Say, uh, whether the formula is satisfiable or whether the formula is a tautology, and uh, so on. So uh, these problems are called decision problems. Uh, of course, uh, there are other types of algorithmic problems like uh, you can consider a problem of uh, transforming a given formula uh, to the equivalent disjunctive normal form. Uh, this is a, an example of a problem which is not a decision problem according to this uh, definition. Uh, but we restrict ourselves only to such type of problems here. So uh, the second, uh, the second important uh, note here is uh, that as you surely understand, uh, if we want to talk about uh, dealing algorithmically with uh, mathematical concepts such as formulae, graphs, and uh, so on, uh, we need to encode these objects um, somehow, and uh, in order to be able to uh, give them as an input to an algorithm. Uh, one of the most general ways of encoding these concepts is uh, using um, words over a finite alphabet. This is just strings of symbols. Uh, so a word is a finite sequence of symbols. Uh, capital Sigma star denotes the set of all uh, words over an alphabet, including the empty word. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, surely you can devise a way of encoding any constructive object you can imagine using words over a finite alphabet. So form are a specific type of word. Graphs also can be encoded, say, using uh, as a list of edges, but all this can be encoded uh, as a word over some fixed alphabet. So this is how we deal with uh, decision problems here. And in this sense, decision problem corresponds to the subset of uh, sigma star because Given a decision problem, you can consider all objects that has that have a given property, and this will be a set of words having this property, and vice versa. If you have some set of words, you can consider the decision problem uh, given a word, given an input, 
uh, decide whether this word belongs to this set of words or not. Um, so formally, a decision problem is just a subset of uh, sigma star, and sometimes uh, such problems are also called languages. And we're talking about the decidability of languages. Um, uh, we will be dealing with complexity classes, and uh, we will measure complexity uh, with respect to the size of the input. And here, since we're dealing with words, uh, it is quite natural to measure the size of the input uh, using its length, which is denoted uh, in this way. Uh, and finally, the definition of the class P um, goes as follows. So a decision problem belongs to the class P. So P stands for polynomially decidable decision problems. So a decision problem is in class P. If there is an algorithm which solves this problem, so what does it mean? It means that for every input, this algorithm works. If you run it on this input, the algorithm works. Uh, uh, so it, it holds in finite uh, time, in finite number of steps, uh, with, an, with an answer, yes or no. And if the input uh, has given property uh, in this decision problem, the algorithm returns yes. And if the, if the input does not have the property, the algorithm returns no. And the main uh, requirement here is that is the restriction on the uh, running time of this algorithm. And the uh, in the case of class P, the requirement looks like this. Uh, the running time of the algorithm in the worst case should be bounded uh, by some polynomial from the size of the input. So meaning that if you fix some natural number n and consider all words of length n and run your algorithm on all this world, on all these words, um, and choose the worst case, the, the uh, longest running time among all words of length n, uh, this value, the worst running time on all words of length n, should be bounded by some, by the value p of n. So there must exist a polynomial which bounds the running time of your algorithm on all inputs in this sense. OK, so an example of a decision problem in the class P is uh, two satisfiability. So when you have a CNF where each uh, clause contains at most two literals, it is known and is that this problem is polynomially solvable using the res resolution method. OK, so this is the class P, polynomially decidable uh, languages, polynomially solvable decision problems. Uh, next, we have uh, the famous NP class, and there are many ways to define it, but here we will consider only two equivalent definitions, which are um, commonly used in the literature. So the first one, uh, let me show it, is just the straightforward uh, generalization of the definition of the class P uh, by uh, considering a uh, more general uh, model of computation. So in the definition of class P, uh, we have not yet defined what, what is an algorithm. How do we deal with algorithms mathematically? We just uh, understand it informally for now. Um, and in the definition of class NP, uh, we allow algorithm to be non-deterministic. But the definition of the class remains uh, the same. Namely, a decision problem belongs to the class NP. If there is an algorithm which solves this problem and runs in polynomial time, but in this case, this algorithm can be non-deterministic. So this is a wider class of algorithms. And I will explain what does it mean in a minute. Uh, P here in, uh, stands for polynomial and N stands for non-deterministic. So NP is non-deterministic polynomial. So these are the decision problems which can be solved in polynomial time using non-deterministic algorithms. And P consists of decision problems which can be solved in polynomial time using deterministic algorithms. So the class NP is uh, uh, wider because we allow more algorithms 
to solve these problems. Uh, what is a non-deterministic algorithm? How do you understand it? So in deterministic algorithm, usually you have a typical computation. If you have an input, it looks just like a sequence of configurations. You transform this input and uh, produce some computations, and each next step is uniquely determined by the previous one. So the uh, computation is just a sequence. It is linear because of the determinism. Uh, at every step, we know which instruction will be carried out, will be executed, and so the deterministic computation is just a sequence. Uh, but in the non-deterministic case, uh, we allow that at any given time of the computation, it may be the case that several instructions, so a finite number of instruction, instructions uh, can be applied. And in this case, the computation is not a sequence, it is not linear, but it, rather it is a tree or a graph, because at any point, if several instructions can apply, you can consider all possibilities, and you will have uh, different paths, different computation uh, sequences, corresponding to the choice of the instructions. But here we do not understand it as say, randomly choosing an instruction. We uh, do not flip a coin to choose an instruction, but rather we consider all possible cases. So if at any point in computation we can, uh, we have several instructions to choose from, we just consider all possible cases. And instead of a sequence, instead of a com computation as a sequence, we have a tree of computations. And each path in this tree corresponds to the choice of instructions. Uh, and so the non-deterministic computation consists of um, many deterministic ones. And uh, this is what we mean by non-deterministic algorithm. And uh, what we need to explain is uh, what does it mean that non-deterministic algorithm decides uh, the, solves the decision problem. So in deterministic case, since the computation is a sequence, is linear, uh, we have a single answer in the end, because it is a sequence and um, everything is deterministic. But here, since we have a tree, we may have that, it may, it may be the case that some branches of this computation lead us to answer yes, and some branches lead us to answer no. And maybe some branches even uh, do not halt at all. So they get into an infinite loop. And the question is, uh, Assume you're in the non-deterministic computation, you have a branch that leads to answer yes, and you have a branch that leads to answer no. So what should be, uh, uh, what should be, um, what should we consider as the result of such a computation? How do we choose? Uh, there are many ways to define this, but here in the uh, definition of the class NP, uh, the definition looks like this. So. You have in this non-deterministic computation tree, uh, each computation, each path through this tree leads to the uh, to some answer if the computation holds. And then we define this the answer of this computation to be yes if at least one path in this tree returns the answer yes. So it may be the case that you have many computations in this non-deterministic process and only one of them return yet, returns yes, and all other ones return no. But still, in this case, we define the answer of the whole computation to be yes. So know that it is not the situation is not symmetric. So the answers yes and no are not symmetric here, unlike in the case of deterministic computations. Because in order to have the answer yes, it must be the case that um, at least one computation branch leads us to answer yes. But in order to have the answer no, it must be the case that no branch returns yes. So it is a different uh, type of condition. Um, and uh, once more, the definition of the class NP um, goes like this. Uh, decision problem belongs to the class NP. If it can be solved by the non-deterministic algorithm working in polynomial time. 
meaning that for every input, if you run your non-deterministic algorithm on this input, you will have a tree of computations of all possible choices of instructions. And uh, meaning that it's polynomial, it works in polynomial time, means that each branch in this tree, so each path through this tree, each computation in this non-deterministic process uh, has length, which is bounded by the polynomial of the size of the input. So in the case of the deterministic computations and p-class, we have a single computation and its size number of steps should be bounded by the uh, polynomial of the size of the input. But here we have many uh, sequences which form a tree and we require that every sequence in this tree should be bounded by the polynomial in the size of the input. And again, what does it mean that this algorithm solves a decision problem? It means that for every input, if uh, the input has the property which we're trying to decide, at least one of the branches should lead to answer yes. And if the uh, input object uh, doesn't have the property, it must be the case that all possible computations on this input lead to answer no. So again, it's not symmetric here. Um, and uh, let's note that um, using non-deterministic computation, computations, one can implement a uh, guessing procedure. Uh, let's consider an example of the satisfiability problem. So as an input, you have a Boolean formula and you want to check whether it's satisfiable or not. So whether there exists an, an assignment of variables uh, which makes the, this formula true. Uh, so deterministically, what uh, we can possibly do is just to search for the satisfying assignment, looking through all assignments. This, of course, uh, would not be a polynomial algorithm because we need to check all assignments and the number of them is exponential in the size of the formula. However, using non-deterministic computations, uh, we can try to guess the satisfying assignment. And what does it mean is that the algorithm works like that. Uh, its first part is non-deterministic and uh, it just non-deterministically writes down uh, the assignment. So it has the following instructions. Write down 0 or 1, move to the next cell. Write down 0 or 1, move to the next cell. And we do this uh, the number of times, uh, which equals the number of variables in the formula. So we write down some sequence of zeros and ones, some assignment using this non-deterministic procedure. And after that, we can uh, use deterministic algorithm which checks given a formula and an assignment. We can polynomially check whether this assignment satisfies this formula just by plugging in zeros and ones into this formula and uh, simplifying the expression to find out whether it's true or not. So uh, the non-determinism here allows us to uh, write down an assignment and then we can polynomially check whether it's satisfying or not. And this actually shows that the algorithm which I've just described uh, shows that the satisfiability problem belongs to the class NP because this algorithm works in polynomial time because the first part, you just uh, write down n zeros and ones, where n is the number of variables. It's certainly bounded by some polynomial of the size of the formula. And then you polynomially check whether this assignment satisfies your formula or not. So uh, this shows that this non-deterministic algorithm uh, is, has a polynomial com time complexity, but it also decides the satisfiability because if the formula is satisfiable, at least one of these as assignments works. And using this non-deterministic guess, we will find it. So at least one of the branches in this guessing uh, will lead us to the answer yes, and vice versa. OK, so this was the first definition of the class NP. And uh, let's have a look at the second one. Do we have any questions in chat? Let's, <clears throat> let's continue. So the second definition uh, looks like this. And uh, uh, the idea behind this is, uh, mm, is very similar to what I've just described using this guessing procedure. So imagine for a second that A of X 
denotes the satisfiability problem. So, so x is a formula and f of x equals 1 if the formula is satisfiable. So if you just write down the definition of the satisfiability, uh, you will arrive at the expression uh, which looks um, similar to the right-hand side of this equivalence, namely the formula is x is satisfiable if there is an assignment, y is an assignment of variables, its length is certainly bounded by some polynomial of the size of the formula, such that some property of x and y holds. So what is this property in the case of satisfiability? R of x, y just says that uh, an assignment y satisfies the formula x. So again, on the left-hand side, formula x is satisfiable if and only if there is an assignment y such that the formula X is satisfied by this assignment, equals true on this assignment of variables. So this is just the definition of the satisfiability. And this, as we've just discussed, this uh, property R of, R of X, Y, uh, can be decided in polynomial time. And this leads us to a general definition of this form. So uh, the decision problem belongs to the class NP, if and only if it can be expressed in this way. So there is some polynomial X I'm sorry, there is some polynomial Q and a property of two variables. So a decision problems of, of a pair, X and Y, which is also solvable in polynomial time deterministic, which belongs to the class P, such that we have this equivalence. So X is a solution of, of the problem A, if and only if there is a Y such that this holds. And in this case, this Y is called a hint or sometimes a certificate because this Y certifies the fact that X is indeed the, the solution. Because again, if you think about the satisfiability problem, if we have in our in our hands the satisfying assignment, it is easy to prove that the formula is satisfiable. If someone gives you the, the, an assignment and says this is a satisfying assignment, you can easily check in polynomial time that it is indeed so. You just plug in the values and check that the formula returns true. And in general case, uh, so in this sense, a problem belongs to the class NP if we can solve it in polynomial time using a hint. So if, if we have a hint Y, we can in polynomial time check that X is indeed the solution of our problem. Um, another, example, another example of this is, uh, for instance, the problem of uh, checking whether a graph has, uh, say, click of a certain uh, um, cardinality. So click of uh, with K uh, on K vertices, K click. Again, in this case, uh, what uh, what is a hint in this case? So on the left hand side, a graph X has a K click if and only if there is a subset of K vertices which span a complete subgraph such that all edges between these vertices belong to the graph. So are you familiar with the definition of click or? OK. Um, and do you know any decision problems related to graphs? Maybe Stepan have mentioned. Oh, OK. Uh, let's move on then. So. Uh, but is it clear, clear what I'm saying now about this definition? Yeah, I have a question. What is Q again? I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, what is Q? Q is a polynomial which bounds the size of the hint. So in particular for, for the satisfiability problem, this Q bounds the size of the satisfying assignment. So Q just, you can take Q, uh, Q of N equal to N because the size of the satisfying assignment is certainly bounded by the size of the formula, right? Because the satisfying assignment is just a string uh, of length uh, which equals uh, the number of the variables of the formula. So Q just bounds the hint. Because if we allow an arbitrary hint, if we uh, remove this condition and just say there is a Y such that some property holds, this is a uh, this leads to a 
a very wide class of decision problems way beyond NP. So again, the problem belongs to the NP class according to the second definition. If it can be solved in polynomial time using a polynomial hint. And by this, I mean that this equivalence holds. And again, I recommend to um, have in mind satisfiability example, because in this case, um, well, you can see that this why, if you just write down the definition of the satisfiability, you arrive at this uh, type of expression. There is an assignment, its size is bounded by polynomial of the size of the formula, and this assignment satisfies the formula X. So, I'm sorry. So what I'm saying is that if we consider the satisfiability problem, so X is an input to our problem and it is a formula, right? You need to, given a formula as an input, you need to decide whether it's satisfiable or not. Uh, so X is satisfiable if there is Y, an assignment of variables, a sequence of zeros and ones. Its size is polynomially bounded by the size of this formula. And R of X, Y just represents, uh, just, uh, um, is defined as an assignment y satisfies the formula x. So a formula is satisfiable if there is a satisfying assignment. This is what uh, is written at the right hand side of this equivalence. So let me ask once more. Uh, are you sure that you have not discussed anything about graphs? OK. Um, so we have two definitions of the NP class. The first one is a straightforward generalization of the definition of the P class by rep obtained by replacing a determ uh, deterministic algorithms with non-deterministic ones. And the second one is using this hint for a certificate. So again, informally, this uh, can be understood that the problem belongs to the class NP if its solution can be uh, checked in polynomial time, meaning that if you have in your hands this Y, this certificate, then you can check that it is indeed the solution. But uh, the formal definition is on the slide. OK, so let's try to understand why these two definitions are equivalent. So there are two, uh, um, there are two implications to prove. Um, the first one. So we want to show that definition two implies definition one. Assume you have a decision problem which belongs to the class NP according to the second definition. So what does it mean? It means that it can be represented in this form. What we want to show is that there is a non-deterministic algorithm working in polynomial time which decides this problem to show that this problem belongs to the class NP according to the first definition, which was given in terms of non-deterministic computations. So assume we have this equivalence, and what we need to do is to devise a non-deterministic algorithm working in polynomial time, which solves, which answers the question whether A of X equals one or not. So this algorithm, uh, we'll just uh, use the right hand side and it works very similar to the algorithm I've described for the satisfiability problem when I've uh, on this slide at the end uh, when we talked about that the algorithm uh, during its first part it just non-deterministically writes down the assignment zeros and ones and then checks whether this assignment satisfies the formula. So here we can do basically the same, but in general case, and instead of assignment, we deal with an arbitrary word Y. So again, what we're trying to show is that if the problem A belongs to the class NP according to this definition, which is on the slide, so such equivalence holds, we need to show that there is a non-deterministic algorithm which decides A in polynomial time. And now we want to describe this algorithm. So the algorithm works like this. Uh, 
at the first stage, it non-deterministically writes down an arbitrary word of this length. So it writes down an arbitrary y of this length. So y is some word in the alphabet, which we fixed at the beginning. And we, we can non-deterministically write down a word of this length. Again, you just have a sequence of columns, uh, a sequence of instructions, like uh, write down one of the finitely many symbols from the alphabet. Not necessarily zeros and ones, as in the case of the satisfiability, but still you have a finite um, set of symbols, and you just have a sequence of comments. Write down one of these symbols. Write down next, at the next cell, write down one of these symbols. And you do this for that many steps, possibly writing down blanks at the end to cover the case when the length of the y, uh, length of y is smaller than q of length of x. After that stage of the algorithm, what you will have on the tape, you will have a word of this of this length, right? If you non-deterministically write down each symbol in this word, and after that. We just using this word, which we written down, have written down non-deterministically, this word y, and an input x. We just check whether r of x y holds, and this can be done in polynomial time by the assumption. Right here it is, r can be solved in polynomial time. So we non-deterministically write down this hint, and then deterministically in polynomial time check whether r of x y is true or not. And if it's true, if it's true, we return true. We return the answer yes. And if not, we return no. So this is basically the same algorithm that decides satisfiability, but instead of assignment, we talk about hint, an arbitrary hint, which is a word in a finite alphabet. So basically the reasoning is the same. Does it, does it make sense to you what I've just said? Okay, so the second implication is uh, a little bit more technical, but uh, let's try to discuss the main idea. So assume that the decision problem belongs to the class NP according to the first definition. So what does it mean? It means that we have a non-deterministic algorithm which solves this problem and works in polynomial time. What we need to show is that uh, there is such a representation for our problem. Right? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So suppose we have this algorithm in our hands, polynomial non-deterministic algorithm which is just size A, and we need what we need to do is to define this R and to explain uh, what kind of hints we consider here. So uh, it is quite natural to consider as a hint a sequence of instructions during this non-deterministic computation. So if we have a non-deterministic algorithm which solves our problem, uh, so what does it mean? It means that at least one if the answer is yes, at least one of the branches of the computation leads to the answer yes. And we need just to, to specify which one, which of these branches leads to answer yes. And so, uh, assuming the choices are binary, this is just a sequence of zeros and ones. And so in this case, this R of XY uh, looks like this. Uh, this is a property which asserts that if you run your non-deterministic alg algorithm on input X, and each time a non-determinism occurs. So you have a, a finite set of instructions to choose from. You choose an, extra, an instruction according to y. So y is a sequence of zeros and ones. If y is zero, you choose first instruction. If y is one, you choose second instruction. And you do this every time you uh, arrive at the branching during this non-deterministic computation. So y basically uh, describes a path through this tree of computations. So again, R of XY just asserts that if you run non-deterministic algorithm, which we have by the first definition, 
on the input X. And whenever you arrive at branching, you have a finite set of instructions to choose from. You choose an instruction according to Y. Then the answer on this computation, deterministic computation, which will, uh, which you will have, should be true. Uh, I'm not sure that this was clear enough. Uh, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, because now it just seems that we are just guessing. OK, so maybe you can ask some specific question. Um, or let me start from the beginning. In the, in the first one, as I see, we are really just guessing. Yeah, then and the second one, uh, there is a Y, and uh, we are following uh, this Y. But how do we know what Y is? So, we do not know what Y is, but in this definition, Y is uh, quantified over existentially. So, let me uh, repeat once more the general uh, course of this proof. What we want to show is that if a problem belongs to the class NP via the first definition, which means that we have a non-deterministic algorithm which decides this problem in polynomial time, we need to show, we want to show that in this case, if we have this algorithm in our hands, we can devise such a representation for our, for our problem. So what we need to do is we need to find this R of XY polynomial property and this polynomial Q and prove that such equivalence holds. This will give us that A belongs to the class NP uh, according to the second definition. OK, so yeah, thank you. Uh, what I've tried to do is uh, I've tried to define this R. So what R means? So R of X, Y is a property that asserts the following. If you run your non-deterministic algorithm on input X, and wh whenever you arrive at, non at uh, branching, so a non-deterministic algorithm, again, it is a sequence of an, a sequence of instructions, but from time to time, it may be the case that uh, it is not a single instruction that can be ex executed, but a finite set of instructions, and we may choose one of them. So, R of X Y asserts that if you run non-deterministic algorithm, which exists by the first definition, on input X, and whenever you arrive at branching in the instructions you choose an instruction according to y, so y just calls a sequence of instructions to choose. So again, if you imagine that this is a uh, tree of computations, and this path means that we, chose, uh, we have chosen first instruction, and this path means that we have chosen second instruction, then a sequence of zeros and ones Codes a path through this tree. So a sequence of instructions to choose during this non-deterministic process. So R of X, Y here asserts that if you run your non-deterministic algorithm on input on input X, and whenever you arrive at branch like here, you choose a way according to y, so here we have a picture. So if y is this binary string, it means that, so we have our, our computation. Assume we have an input x and we just run our algorithm on it. And here, for the first time, we arrive at the situation where we need to choose between two instructions. And since y have zero here, the first digit here is zero, we choose this path, we choose this instruction between these two. And after that, we have a linear sequence of computation. And we arrive at the non-determinism again. We arrive at the uh, pair of instructions to choose from for the second time. And we need to choose one of them to continue our computation. And we choose the this one, 
because the second digit of y is one. So one is up. If one will go up, if zero will go down. And then again, we uh, continue our computation and arrive at the need of choosing between two instructions during this non-deterministic process. And we choose the bottom one because the third digit of y is zero. And we continue in this fashion. So r of x, y. So if you have this y, you can run your non-deterministic algorithm and choose specific instructions every time you uh, arrive at the non-deterministic part. So if during your computation, uh, you have several instructions to choose from for the next step in the computation. And you have this Y, which tells you how to choose these instructions. You can just run this computation by choosing these instructions according to Y. And R of X, Y asserts that if we run our non-deterministic algorithm on the input X in this fashion, choosing instructions according to Y, then the answer is yes. And why this equivalence holds then? Well, because A of X equals to one, if and only if there is a sequence uh, of instructions which leads to answer yes. This was in the first definition, right? If at least one execution trajectory yields yes, then the answer is yes. And here, what does this equivalence uh, say? It says that uh, there is a trajectory which is coded by this Y. So this again, this Y codes a path in this tree, codes a trajectory in the computation tree, a sequence of instructions. So here, the right hand side says that there is a sequence of instructions, there is a path through the computation tree, such that if we run our non deterministic algorithm on input X using this particular sequence of instructions, choosing it according to Y, we will have answer yes. So basically, the right hand side just asserts uh, what's written here. It says that at least one path through this computation tree. So there exists Y. At least one path leads to answer yes. So why is this path can be bounded by a polynomial? Because the initial algorithm works in polynomial time. So every path, every computation path has polynomial size. There's polynomially many steps uh, with respect to the size of X. I'm not sure that uh, this clarified anything. Maybe you have some questions. A simple example with Y and X, for example, with CNF. Well, it's not quite uh, easy to do because uh, here the nature of this definition is that we are given an arbitrary algorithm. We don't, we do not know how it works, and we need to do, devise such a representation for our problem. So everything is unclear, right? Or maybe some parts were. It's pretty clear now. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I'm ready to explain it uh, once more if you can ask something. Let me try to say a few words about that and then we'll try to move on. So do you do you understand the idea behind the non-deterministic algorithm? So it might 
it might be the case in deterministic algorithm, every next step is uniquely determined by the previous one. You, there is exactly one instruction which you need to execute at every step of the computation. But in, in the non-deterministic case, it might be that you have several instructions to choose from. Like in our algorithm for satisfiability, we had an, an instruction, write down zero and write down one move to the next cell, write down zero, write down one. And we we have chosen between these two instructions at every step. And after that, we have written down an assignment, a sequence of zeros and ones, non-deterministically. So if you have such an algorithm in your hands, non-deterministic, where you can choose, how can you execute it on a given input? Let's think about that. So you have an input and you want to execute your non-deterministic algorithm. For deterministic algorithm, it's easy because every um, because at every step you know which instructions uh, to execute, right? You just execute the instructions one by one in a sequence. But if you have a non-deterministic algorithm, uh, from time to time you may uh, it may happen that you have a finite set of instructions to choose from. You computed something and then uh, you are at this step of the computation that you have two instructions to choose from. So which instructions uh, should be carried out next? And you need to choose either first or second. So in order to be able to, uh, exec to run this computation till the end, you need to make this choice. And you should do this every time you uh, happen to be in this situation so so the computation can be represented as a tree so we compute something deterministically and then we arrive at the uh, step of the computation where we need to choose first ins instruction or second if we cho choose first instructions we go here the computation goes like this and if we chose second instruction the computation goes like this again we compute something and then we arrive at the situation where we need to choose between two instructions if we choose first one, the computation goes here. If we choose second one, the computation goes here. So in order to be able to, let me repeat it once more, in order to be able to uh, run the non-deterministic algorithm on a given input, you need to make these choices during the computation in order to, to be able to obtain an answer. And if someone gives you the sequence of choice, choices to make, you can just run your algorithm and use this sequence. So here again, we run our non-deterministic algorithm on an input X and arrive at the situation where we need to choose first or second instruction. We look at this Y and see that its first digit is zero. Zero means that we choose the instruction uh, at the bottom. We compute, we choose this instruction and continue the computation and arrive at the situation where we need to choose once more. We look at the second digit of y. It is one. So it means that we choose this, uh, the uh, instruction that goes up and we continue the computation. Choose this instruction, execute it and continue the computation. Arrive at the situation where we need to choose once more. We look at the third digit of y. It is zero, so we choose this. We go down. And we continue in this way until the computation halts with some answer. So if someone tells you which instructions to choose, you can carry out the basically the deterministic computation, having non-deterministic algorithm, because you just uh, your computation will be just one of these paths because someone told you which instructions to choose. And so, finally, um, if we have this non-deterministic algorithm, this R just asserts that if you run this on input X using this sequence of choices Y, it returns one. And so, A of X equals to one according to the first definition. If there is a 
computation in this tree of computations, which leads to answer one. But that's basically what's uh, what we're what's written down here because it says there is a sequence of instruction, there is a sequence of choices y, such that if you run your algorithm on input x according to this sequence of choices, so basically if you run a specific path through this tree, you will arrive at answer one. So we just represent the definition of a non-deterministic computation. What does it mean that it uh, gives answer yes? As was written down here, we just express it in this way. So this, this is what we need to show that the first definition implies the second one. Hope that at least something um, is understandable. So let's try to move on. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, no, having if in our code doesn't make this NP algorithm. Um, we will discuss the, I think, if we'll have time, a specific mathematical model of non-deterministic computations. And I don't think I understood this question, so if you don't mind, let me define uh, one of the most important notions here. Uh, it is the notion of NP completeness. So we have these two classes, the class P is the class of decision problems which can be solved in polynomial time using standard, our standard intuition of what an algorithm is, deterministic procedure which works in polynomial time. And we have this class NP, so the first definition of which just generalized the definition of the class P in a way that we allow it to use non-deterministic algorithm. So decision problem belongs to the class NP if it can be solved in polynomial time, but using non-deterministic algorithms. So certainly, each deterministic algorithm is a particular case of a non-deterministic one, because in the non-deterministic algorithm, we just have more possibilities, but certainly we can just ignore our uh, the possibility of using non-determinism, and we can just so a deterministic algorithm is a particular case of a non-deterministic one where no non-determinism occurs. This is not, uh, this is allowed by the definition. So uh, this, uh, that's why this uh, inclusion holds. If you can decide your problem in polynomial time uh, using deterministic algorithm, you can certainly decide in, in polynomial time using non-deterministic one because the class of non-deterministic algorithms is wider. You have more non-deterministic algorithms, and each deterministic algorithm is a specific case of a non-deterministic one. So here we allow more algorithms for solving problems, and that's why we have this inclusion. Um, the major open question in this uh, in complexity theory and in this area is, of course, the question of uh, whether the converse inclusion holds, so whether the equality holds here, whether P is equal to NP. So what does it mean P is equal to NP if uh, every decision problem which can be solved using non-deterministic algorithm in polynomial time can actually be solved using a deterministic one. So if P is equal to NP, uh, non-determinism in our definition of this class uh, does not lead to any uh, does not lead uh, to any uh, let's say so if p is equal to np then uh, what does it mean is that non determinism doesn't lead to uh, anything significant 
in terms of complexity, in terms of solving decision problems and their complexity, because everything that can be uh, solved using non-deterministic al algorithm can be solved already using a deterministic one. So, but uh, as you surely know, this is a this is an open question, a very challenging, um, one of the most famous mathematical uh, hypotheses, conjectures. I'm sorry. Um, and but what's important is that even for specific problems such as three satisfiability or just satisfiability, it is not known whether it is known that they belong to the class NP. Previously, we discussed why satisfiability is. Belongs to the class NP. If you remember this algorithm where we write down the assignment and then check whether it satisfies a formula or not, this was a non-deterministic algorithm which runs in polynomial time and decides satisfiability. Guess the assignment using non-determinism and then check whether this assignment satisfies your formula or not in polynomial time. So satisfiability and three satisfiability belongs to NP, but it is not known whether the satisfiability problem can be solved in polynomial time using deterministic algorithm. And it turns out that this question is actually equivalent to the equality between these two classes. So P is equal to NP, if and only if three satisfiability can be solved in polynomial deterministic time. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this follows from this whole theory of NP completeness. And let me finally give the definition of an NP complete problem. So again, let's, let's think about this inclusion. So let me ask. Um, is it clear that this inclusion holds or not? Or sh I should explain it once more. I'm sorry. Um, it is not known whether P is, is equal to NP or not. What we know is that P is included in NP. Why? Because in the definition of the class NP, we allowed to use more algorithms. So P consists of problems which can be decided, deterministic algorithms working in polynomial time, and NP is the set of problems which can be decided uh, using non-deterministic algorithms in polynomial time. So this is a wider class of algorithms, so we can solve more problems. Everything which we can solve using deterministic algorithm, we can surely solve using non-deterministic one because a deterministic algorithm is a specific case of a non-deterministic algorithm. You just don't use, uh, you just don't have in your program uh, any place where you need to choose instructions. So if it's not clear, please uh, ask one question because this is, I'm not sure it makes sense to proceed if this is unclear. OK, so do you understand the definition of the class P and the class NP? Yes. So this inclusion, what are your thoughts about this? Can you explain why this inclusion holds? I did it several times, but I think <laughs> We have some problems with understanding the definition of the class NP, and that's why it's not clear. It's a more general structure, so, so and like a sequence is a specific case of a tree. So if you have a deterministic algorithm, it is just by definition a non-deterministic, but a trivial case of a non-deterministic one where we do not make any choices. This is not uh, prohibited by the definition of the non-deterministic algorithm. It may be the case that in the non-deterministic algorithm, 
we do not have places where we need to choose between several instructions. So every deterministic, deterministic algorithm is a specific case of the non-deterministic one. So that's why if you can solve your problem using deterministic algorithm in polynomial time, this same algorithm counts as a non-deterministic algorithm solving this same problem in polynomial time. So that's why this problem also, if it belongs to P, it also belongs to NP. And so, again, we want to... Uh, So we want to understand whether the uh, converse holds or whether the equality holds. So whether every problem from the class NP belongs to P. And a natural way to do this, because these classes are defined in terms of complexity, in terms of running time of the algorithm, uh, it makes sense. So uh, the, the most natural candidate for a problem which belongs to NP but does not belong to P is the hardest problem in the class NP. Because if the hardest problem in the class NP belongs to P, then surely every easier problem, so if the hardest problem from NP can be solved in polynomial time, then surely every easier problem can also be solved in polynomial time. Because we're defi we define these classes in terms of complexity. If something belongs to P, and you have an easier problem, which can be reduced to this one, it also belongs to P. So, if we want to look for a natural candidate which demonstrates that these classes are, are not equal, it makes sense to look uh, among the hardest problems in the class NP. So this is the intuition li that leads to the definition of the NP completeness, of NP completeness. So a, prob a problem is called NP complete um, informally, and we will give a formal definition in a minute. If it is the hardest problem in the class NP, so it belongs to NP because we want to find a problem which separates these classes. And it is the hardest possible problem. And as I've just said, if such a problem, if an NP complete problem, which is the hardest problem in the class NP, hardest in terms of some measure of complexity of problems, if an NP complete problem can be solved in polynomial time, then every easier problem can also be solved in polynomial time because we define these classes in terms of complexity. And it means that every problem from the class NP can be solved in polynomial time because the hardest problem from this class can be solved in polynomial time. And certainly every other problem, since this was the hardest one, every other problem can also be solved in polynomial time if the hardest one can be solved. So let's have a look at this statement. If we can solve an NP complete problem, and we will show that three satisfiability and it is an NP complete problem. For instance, if we can find a polynomial algorithm for solving three satisfiability or just satisfiability, then these classes are equal. So as I've said, this is an an equivalent formulation of this problem. P is equal to NP if and only if three satisfiability can be solved in polynomial time. And this, this is based on the fact that three satisfiability is an example of an NP complete problem. So three satisfiability in some sense is the hardest possible problem in the class NP. And vice versa, by contraposition, if P is not equal to NP, so if there are problems which can be solved non-deterministically in polynomial time, but cannot be solved deterministically in polynomial time, then any NP complete problem should be such an example. So any NP complete problem in this case provides an example of a decision problem which separates these classes. So if P is not equal to NP, we have plenty of problems which are no, which belong to the class NP but cannot be solved in polynomial time. Okay, so let's have a look at the formal definition of uh, NP completeness. Here in the informal definition, uh, we've talked about 
hardest possible problem. So in order to be able to formalize this, we need some way of comparing different decision problems in order to be able to say that one is the hardest. So we need some way of mathematically uh, capturing the idea that one decision problem uh, is harder than another in order to be able to define the hardest possible problem in the class NP. So we need some way of comparing problems in terms of hardness. And uh, there are many ways to do this, but uh, here the most common way is called M reduction or carpet reduction. And we say that the decision problem A is reducible to the decision problem B, and this is denoted like this. Uh, if the following equivalence holds for some polynomially computable function. So informally, what does it mean? So we want informally problem A is reducible to problem B. If under the assumption that we can solve problem B, we can also find a way of solving problem A. So in it is a, so this idea informally captures that problem A can be reduced to problem B. We can reduce the solution of problem A to the solution of problem B. If we can solve B, then we can devise a way of solving problem A. There are many ways to make this mathematically precise, but here's one of them. So basically, let's have a look at this equality. A of X equals to B of F of X. So in order to solve problem A, given an input X, what we need to do is Firstly, transform this input X using some polynomially computable function. So F of X is just transformation of the input. And then solve problem B. So in this case, we say that A is reducible to B. So let's think about uh, the following example. As we're trying to give a mathematical definition of what does it mean to be hard right now. And in order to do this, so basically a problem is hard if every other problem can be reduced to it. Well, I think it's quite natural to think so. The problem is hard if every other problem can be reduced to it, right? It's a natural definition of hardness. And this is what's written here. A problem is NP hard if every problem from the class NP can be reduced to it. So hard means that if we can solve B, we can solve any other problem from the class NP. So the problem B is NP hard if it um, using the solution for B, we can find a solution for every other problem from the class NP. So again, let's have a look at this uh, equality to understand the nature of the reduction. Uh, let's assume that. Uh, so let me ask this, I think, for the third time. Um, the word graph was not uh, pronounced during the first two lectures, right? So you, you have no idea what a graph is. No, we know what graph is, but we didn't discuss it a lot. OK, so. Um, so let's think about it informally. So a graph is just a set of vertices, right? And some edges between them. So you, you have this picture. You can have this picture in your mind. And there are many problems concerning graphs, decision problems. So given a graph, uh, decide whether it has some property or not. And there are many properties which are interesting uh, to consider here. So one of them is, given a graph, can you color its vertices, say, in three colors, such that no two, uh, for every pair of vertices for which there is an edge between them, these two vertices have different colors. So can you color the graph in such a way that uh, 
there is no edge between vertices of the same color. So this is one of the decision problems uh, for graphs. Given a graph, uh, decide whether it has this property or not. And so assume that A is a, so assume that A is this problem. X is a graph, and we want to decide whether it has some property or not, whether it can be colored in some way or something like that. And B, assume that B is a satisfiability problem. So to say that this problem about graphs can be M reduced to satisfiability means that there is some transformation which given a graph outputs a formula such that this graph has a certain property can be colored in three colors. If and only if the formula which is obtained from this graph using this transformation is satisfiable. So we can reduce the question of whether a graph has some property to the question of whether some formula constructed from this graph is satisfiable or not. So this, what does it mean to M, redu M reduce one problem to another? So A is M reducible to B. If there is some transformation of the inputs to the problem A to the inputs uh, of the problem B, such that X is a solution of problem A, even only if the transformed uh, input f of x is a solution to the problem B. So, and vice versa, we can uh, imagine that A of x is satisfiability. So, x is a formula, and we need to decide whether it's satisfiable or not. And B is some uh, property of graphs, color of BDC. And uh, in order to show that satisfiability can be reduced to checking some property of graphs, we need to define a way of transforming a given formula into the graph. So you are given a formula and you need to algorithmically output a graph, which somehow depends on this formula. So you look at the structure of this formula and you construct certain graph, which, which is somehow related to your formula. And you want to do, to do it in such a way that the formula is satisfiable if and only if this graph has some property. So again, we reduced the, the single question of satisfiability to the question of whether a graph constructed from this formula has some property or not. So we reduced the problem of checking satisfiability to the problem of checking certain properties of graphs. Um, so this is the nature of M reduction. Uh, excuse me, can you explain uh, what is P and M in this notation? Uh, these are just, so this is a uh, whole symbol. So these are not parameters. M stands for many one. And I'm not think, I don't think I'm able to explain what does it mean uh, so that it will be clear. Basically, it means that many questions about uh, many questions about uh, say satisfiability if x is a satisfiability can be reduced to a single question about graphs and p stands for polynomial so this is m reduction which is uh, which is carried out by a poly polynomially computable function so p stands for polynomial m stands for many one but this is just the notation these are not the parameters the parameters here are a and b. So f of x should be polynomial. Yeah, it should be polynomially computable. It should not be a polynomial as a function. It should be because it works, uh, it maps a set of words to the set of words. It should be polynomially computable. So there must be polynomial algorithm, which given an input x works for polynomially many steps with respect to the size of x and outputs the value of this function. So this, this is uh, what it means for a function from words to words to be polynomial computable. OK, thank you. OK, so um, let me say it once more. M reduction captures the idea of reducing uh, a single question 
about problem A to a single question about problem B. So we can reduce the question of whether the formula is satisfiable to the question of whether some graph which is constructed from this formula using this F. In this case, this F would be a transformation that given a formula as an input output some graph. So and we reduce the question of whether this formula is satisfiable to a single question of whether this transformed graph obtained from this formula has some property. So this is the, the nature of M reduction. Uh, usually such reduction such reductions are called strong and this is because in our intuitive understanding of what does it mean to reduce one problem to another uh, which is if we have a solution of problem b then using this solver for b we can solve a this are this is our intuitive understanding of reduction if we has if we have a solver for a then we can solve if we have a solver for b then we can solve a uh, in this informal understanding certainly we can imagine then um, in the process of solving a using the solver for b we can use this solver many times we can ask many questions about decision problem b unlike in this definition where you you have an input x you need to transform it in polynomial time and then ask a single question about uh, b so this is a, a very restricted form of reduction, but typically it, uh, but it's quite common and is sufficient for all applications here. So finally, we have this notion of reduction. Again, it captures the idea that problem A is not harder than problem B. A is reducible to B if A is not harder than B. If we can solve B, then we can solve A. And the problem is called NP hard. If it's. Uh, if every problem from the class NP is not harder than B, so can be reduced to B. This is what we mean by hard. And this is a mathematical formal definition of hardness. Once more, a problem is NP hard if every other problem from the class NP can be reduced to a problem B in this sense excuse me once again so b is harder than a uh, uh in in a computational way uh, i would say not harder but not easier because here we have less than or equal so, okay so why are we reducing it to the harder problem uh, what we wanted to do now uh, is give a mathemat mathematically formal definition of the hardest possible problem. And okay. this hard okay. hardest okay. possible problem appeared uh, from the intuitive idea of demonstrating that these classes are unequal by showing by uh, studying the case of the hardest problems from the class NP. If there is an example of problem in the class NP which cannot be solved in polynomial time, certainly the hardest problem in NP must be such an example because if we can solve the hardest problem in polynomial time then surely we can solve any other problem in polynomial time so and in order to make this precise we we've tried to define the notion of hardness and we call the problem hard NP hard and this is a formal way of saying hardest possible problem if every other problem in the class NP can be reduced to it. So it is hard in this sense that anything else from NP can be reduced to solving problem B. If we can solve problem B, then we can solve everything from the class NP informally. But formal definition is given via this reduction. And finally, the uh, problem B is NP complete. Uh, if it is NP hard, and it itself belongs to NP. So NP complete problem is a problem from the class NP. Which is the hardest possible in this sense. A problem is NP complete. If it belongs to the class NP itself and anything else from the class NP can be reduced to it. So this. This is the notion of NP completeness and. Uh, let me finish with. Um,
think let me finish with the statement of the one of the most fundamental results here. So, um, Cook Levin theorem, uh, it provides an, expl an explicit example of uh, the of an NP-complete problem. So the hardest possible problem in the class NP, which is a natural candidate for separating classes P and NP. If we want to find a problem which belongs to NP but not NP, as I've said many times, it makes sense to look uh, among um, the hardest problems in the class NP. And the Cook-Levin Cook theorem just asserts that satisfiability of Boolean formulas is NP-complete. So this problem belongs to the class NP, as we've discussed when uh, I gave the definition of the class NP. And this theorem asserts that it is actually NP-complete too. So satisfiability for Boolean formulas is the hardest possible problem in the class NP. Every other problem from the class and P can be reduced to satisfiability. So uh, no matter what problem in the class NP you have, you can always find a way of reducing uh, the decidability question for this problem to the satisfiability of certain Boolean formula. So the language of Boolean formulas is rich enough to be able to capture uh, every other problem from the class NP. This, this is how uh, we can view this theorem, but again, the main uh, content of this theorem is that it provides a specific example of an NP-complete problem. And uh, because of this theorem, the conjecture uh, P equals NP is equivalent to the assertion that satisfiability problem can be solved in polynomial time deterministically. So satisfiability belongs to P. This is equivalent to P, to the equality between P and NP because of this theorem. Because if we can solve in polynomial time the hardest possible problem in NP, then we can solve every problem in NP in polynomial time. So um, let me finish here. 